we're back. Welcome back. It's me, Brandon Steckler, technical editor of Motor Age Magazine. And today we're going to be filming video four in my series of Mastering Diagnostics with yours truly. Today's video is going to be about building a customized PID list. And what I mean by that is this. We all know on today's vehicles, interfacing a scan tool gives us an abundance of information right at our fingertips. And the point is, I'm sure a lot of you have experienced over the years, this can become extremely overwhelming, especially when we don't know what the heck we're looking at. So I'm going to help try and make sense of it all. Now the idea about building a customized PID list is to allow us to stare at the data that we want to see, and only that data. Not only will that speed up our scan tools refresh rate, its ability to grab data and update it periodically on the, on the scan tool screen, but will also limit the distraction that you and I are faced with on a day-to-day -day basis. And let's face it, as diagnosticians, as drivability technicians, we got a lot on our plate to begin with. The last thing we need is any added noise. So with that, the question becomes, what do we put on our customized PID list? I want you to keep something in mind. When I collect data, whether that data is from a scan tool, like we're gonna be utilizing today, or perhaps a DSO, a digital storage oscilloscope, the data I choose to capture, I want it to tell a story. I should be able to capture data in a fashion that if I were to hand that data over to a seasoned, trained technician who understands what that data means, he or she should be able to evaluate that data. Not knowing what's wrong with the vehicle, they should be able to evaluate that data and therefore make a diagnostic decision. Now here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to make the mistake in thinking that every decision I make from the driver's seat leads to a parts replacement. That's not what it's about. Guys, what it's about is this, getting some information easily at my fingertips why I'm comfy and cozy right in the driver's seat and using that information to then decide what it is I want to approach as far as testing. There's a million things under that hood. I don't want to test all of them. So when I evaluate a vehicle, I never approach a vehicle with the thought in mind that I'm here to fix this car. That's not what's happening in my mind. I'm approaching the vehicle with the mindset of there are a million things on this vehicle that could be broken or not functioning properly. I want to eliminate everything that is functioning properly. Said another way, I'm not trying to figure out what's wrong with the vehicle. I'm trying to figure out what's right with the vehicle. That's what I do when I approach a vehicle. And it's brought me a tremendous amount of success and efficiency. And I always say, if you have a success, efficiency, then comes the money, and then comes the confidence. So with that, with the story that we are trying to build with our scan tool, we are trying to establish a couple of things. First of all, is the vehicle running properly? What I mean by that is, are there any exhibited drivability faults or symptoms? Two, is the vehicle, is the PCM keeping the vehicle in fuel control? Are we delivering the air fuel ratio that we decided, we desired, excuse me, we desired to deliver? That's staying within fuel control. The other half of that equation is this. What about fuel trim? Fuel trim is a corrective factor. Fuel trim basically states how hard we are working to keep that vehicle in fuel control. Said another way, I can be in perfect fuel control and have a tremendous amount of fuel trim corrective factor. So the vehicle is running great, but we're working really hard to keep it running great. And on the flip side, I could be out of fuel control, meaning no matter how hard I try, I am not delivering the air fuel ratio to that cylinder, to those cylinders, the air fuel ratio that I intended to deliver because there's something wrong and we simply can't take control of it. Now, before we head out to that vehicle, I want you to keep one thing in mind. 
not every vehicle is configured the same way and they don't all use the same system strategies and with the advancements in technology we see today with Atkinson cycling and auto cycling and variable cam timing and variable valve lift and duration and gasoline direct injection and auto stop start and and you name it there are many 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 different strategies at play here so understand that every vehicle is a bit different and you have to become familiar with that vehicle and understand what those strategies are trying to accomplish as far as a goal goes and how they go about doing it but this subject vehicle is an older 2006 Honda Civic and I demonstrate these older vehicles for a reason because it's as basic as you can get and there's no way in heck you're gonna understand how to approach those vehicles with with newer technology if you don't understand the basics so we base everything around the basics now one point I want to bring up is this regarding basics there are two basic fueling strategies most vehicles of especially this era will abide by one of which is a speed density fueling strategy meaning we use pressure sensors in the intake manifold to measure the pressure and we compare that to the pressure in the atmosphere to determine what we know is pressure differential and what does pressure differential mean to us pressure differential means how hard the air is pushing trying to get into the engine so once we determine that and we factor in things like air temperature and temperature of the engine and engine RPM and throttle position as long as the PCM knows the displacement of the engine how much air that engine can pump we can figure out almost precisely just how much air is entering the engine on the flip side we don't use a speed density fueling strategy we use a direct measurement fueling strategy known as mass airflow sensor evaluation that measures the airflow more directly in the end both strategies work very well however they respond very very different to the same symptoms to the same faults so we need to know what vehicle excuse me we need to know what fueling strategy our vehicle utilizes so the first thing you're gonna see me do when I approach a vehicle with a drivability problem is open the hood and see what I'm dealing with then I know how to customize my PID list to see the data I need to see so we can make some diagnostic decisions you know and I gotta say something before we head out to the car I, I just gotta take a moment to to thank some people um, for starters for World Pack for giving me this opportunity but but second um, my good buddy Chad Snitz over at Top Don. He's loaning me this Top Don Phoenix Smart. Never had my hands on this tool before, but uh, I'm excited to implement it and see what it can do. Take it for a test drive along with the vehicle. So, thanks again. I appreciate you. Now let's head out to the car. So keep in mind when we are evaluating a vehicle, we want to understand what fueling system we are dealing with. This vehicle utilizes a mass airflow sensor for its fueling strategy. So it's very important we understand that ahead of time. And now that we know that, we know what data to acquire so we can make some analyses and come up with a diagnostic decision. All right, as promised, we're at the car again, and we're gonna be grabbing some data right from the driver's seat, right from the DLC with our scan tool. And again, the idea is to get data that tells a story we want the data to tell us how the vehicle is operating and what I mean by that is whether or not we are in fuel control and if we are in fuel control how hard is the PCM working to maintain the fact that we are inside fuel control so with our Phoenix smart from top Don, we are going to be building ourselves a custom PID list and you know what I want to what I want to point out and, and it's a very important fact is the data I'm going to be using today does not require factory OEM level software we are talking about global OBD2 software that virtually any scan tool nowadays can offer you so I'm going to enter the main menu here again choosing EOBD2 and we're going to allow the screen to populate with the data once it establishes communication with the vehicle. And there we have it. 
So it's identified the vehicle by VIN. These are our OBD2 modes of operation. Of course we want mode 1 which is to read live data. So all the PIDs available to me for my PCM but again the point is customizing a PID list is going to save us time because our scan tool is going to refresh a lot faster meaning the data we choose to gather and view is going to be acquired at a much faster rate and and would therefore make it more accurate so when I'm acquiring data I always want a point of reference and that would be maybe throttle position and absolute load and that's going to tell me how the vehicle is being driven and how it's pumping air through the engine I want to view vast airflow sensor value data because this is the main input to determine how much air is coming into the engine on this vehicle and of course we need to know that so we can fuel accordingly I'm going to scroll through and I'm going to choose equivalence ratio which is basically having a gas analyzer in the tailpipe by way of our universal exhaust gas oxygen sensors otherwise stated wideband or wide range air fuel ratio sensors I want engine RPM again I want to know how the engine is being how the vehicle is being operated fuel system status to make sure we are in closed loop operation meaning our O2 sensors and our air fuel ratio sensors are being factored into the equation for fuel delivery long term fuel trim corrective factor and short term fuel trim corrective factor and that should do it so that will complete our customized PID list and as always you guys know I love to graph because my eyes don't process numbers very well and as you can see these numbers are periodically updating but there's no way you and I can make a mental connection between the PIDs by looking at them in this format so if we graph them all these PIDs are graphed out in different colors and I even have the ability to combine them if need be and we'll demonstrate that a little bit later so what we're gonna do is go on a road test now and operate this vehicle under different driving conditions so with the road test the idea is to capture the data that we have plotted on a scan tool screen in graphical format and that data tells a story but it only tells part of the story that data will only reflect how the car is behaving under its current operating conditions and we're all well aware that faults can occur at idle that don't occur at elevated RPM or higher load values and on the flip side we have a car that may be running perfectly normal at idle but under heavy load and and higher RPM is when the fault is is present so we must capture this data under different operating conditions to ensure we stress this vehicle from different perspectives and we will then capture the data with the scan tool simultaneously and when we get back safe and sound at our work bay and we can evaluate that data and make an analysis we will determine what's wrong with the vehicle from there and the idea is to determine where we want to invest time testing we don't want to test everything under the hood that's a waste of time you and I this is not a hobby for us this is income so we want to stay efficient and accurate as well so we're gonna perform the road test and we are gonna operate the vehicle at idle for several seconds and we're just gonna wait for traffic to pass and then we're slowly gonna roll into the throttle and accelerate to about 15 miles per hour under steady throttle we're going to allow the vehicle's fueling system to stabilize and maintain fuel control. And after about five seconds or so, I'm going to accelerate, roll into the throttle heavy, and put a tremendous amount of load on the engine. And then I'm going to back down again and allow the vehicle to decelerate. And now I'm going to cruise just like I did at 15 miles an hour with steady light throttle except this time I'm going to cruise at about 30 to 35 miles an hour just nice steady throttle and the idea behind all of this 
is again to place the vehicle under every operating condition it will experience in the real world while driving down our motorways. Whether it's at idle, light cruise, steady moderate cruise, or heavy full throttle acceleration under load, we are replicating all of those driving conditions, as you can see, within just one minute of driving. So I'm gonna pull over, and I'm going to allow the vehicle to idle for a couple more seconds. Take it to a stop. And there you have it. Simple as that. So let's go back to the work bay and evaluate the data, make some diagnostic decisions. So we're back, and this time we are safe and sound in the shop so we can evaluate our captured data and make a decision. I'm not on the side of the road worrying about getting hit by a car or causing an accident. I'm sitting away from the vehicle and I'm trying to evaluate data. This is what we call an analytic process. So I'm going to visit my history tab and it's going to allow me to cap to, to review the stored data I have in the scan tool buffer. Now I'm connected to my PC right now so I can stream it. Um, I'm, I'm doing this via um, via Wi-Fi right now through Team Viewer, so it's pretty neat what these scan tools can do nowadays. So I'm going to access my data stream, and these are the PIDs I wish to view. So I'm going to select all, and OK. And again, the default is to place it numeric value, but I want it scaled on a graph. So I'm going to look at the data as it's plotted. And I can press play and simply let this play out like a movie, or I can take control of it by clicking on this and dragging it across. Now what you'll see in your values here is add this as this progresses, the number you see here is what's being displayed currently. So if I grab this and drag it, I want you to reference engine RPM because you could probably relate closest to this from the video of me performing the road test from inside the vehicle. So keep your eyes fixed over here as I progress through the video. So here I start the car and I'm sitting at the stop sign. And I pull out of the stop sign and start to accelerate and we can see the RPM climbing. It creates a shift to second gear. And I'm going to let it stabilize for a few seconds at steady state RPM. That's second gear right there. I'm going to stop right there because now I'm cruising. So what you see right here is what's being displayed up here. And the same holds true for all the other PIDs displayed on the screen. So what can we see? First and foremost, we are in closed loop, meaning our fuel trim can be reflected upon and it's being factored into the fuel delivery process, the equation. Our commanded air fuel ratio, or what we call equivalence ratio, is about 99, excuse me, 0.996, which we are, means we're about 1% away, 1% on the rich side of stoichiometry. Point being is our actual equivalence ratio, this is what the PCM desires for fuel, air fuel ratio, and this is what we'd achieve. We're just slightly lean. We are 1% lean of stoichiometry. So said another way, we are pretty darn close. Now what you'll know here, notice here, is that long-term fuel trim and short-term fuel trim total is about 17% negative. Now, typically, I'd say this may be an issue. But what I did was, right before I began this road test, I just filled my fuel tank considerably. So I verified this, and I'm not going to waste any time showing you this here. Um, but I went back and looked, and um, my purge valve is being commanded on at about 20% duty cycle right now. So we are pulling fuel vapors, vapor load from the evaporative emissions canister and feeding the engine. And as a result, the PCM is taking away some fuel injector pulse width to allow for that. So this is totally normal. We're not seeing a problem right here. So I'm going to progress further. Again, we are at steady state operating RPM, probably about 15 miles an hour here. And then you'll see, if you recall, I accelerate heavily 
and we continue to climb and continue to climb. Let me go back to that peak right about there, about 4,000 RPMs. We're pumping about 70 grams of air per second, give or take. Our commanded air fuel ratio again is about about stoichiometry, about 1.0, and we are almost exactly there. Meaning we are in really, really good fuel control. The vehicle is performing properly. The PCM is making the proper decision to deliver fuel and the combustion process is happening properly. Again, long-term fuel trim and short-term fuel trim total at about 12% negative, and the reason is because my purge valve is being commanded on. I'm gonna continue further, and you'll notice I come down off the heavy load, and we once again will go into a cruise, this time at about 35 miles an hour, so let's let that stabilize. That's pretty stable, right there. We can see our commanded air fuel ratio is about 2% rich, and we are about 1% mm, rich, give or take. So, again, really, really good fuel control. And again, long term fuel trim, short term fuel trim, negative 14. Totally normal because our purge valve is being held open. So, my point is. This data is showing us that the vehicle is performing properly. Not only are we in fuel control, but we do not have a fuel trim issue. What we see here is simply a result of the purge valve delivering canister vapor load to the engine. Now, if that was not occurring, if I looked and that was not occurring, I would then reflect on these other PIDs to determine if there may be another problem. And what this will do is give me a sense of direction on what to approach next. So I know I make it appear easier than what it actually is. But you know what, my friends, it just takes a little bit of practice acquiring the data. We understood the vehicle we were working on, right? We understood our enemy. Um, it's a mass airflow style fueling uh, strategy. We collected the data that tells a story and we evaluated that data after performing a road test that carried the vehicle through virtually all operating conditions it would experience on the road, all in less than a minute. We pulled ourselves away from the vehicle to evaluate the data and we make some diagnostic decisions. I do want to reiterate that I am not there to fix the car. I am there to evaluate data, to perform analyses, to determine what I want to approach with my hands. I don't want to approach everything. I don't want to guess what's wrong with the car from the driver's seat. I want to get a really good idea of what I think is failing before I approach a problem. And once I have that idea, once I rule out things that simply cannot be, I focus on the possibilities. And that's where I direct my testing, my hands-on testing. And this is how I remain efficient and profitable and when my confidence started growing. So I want you to tune in next time for our upcoming video, the analytic road test. And what that analytic road test is going to allow us to do is the same thing we did today. But I have a surprise for you. I am actually going to be introducing a fault. And I'm not going to tell you what it is. But you and I are going to evaluate the data together so we can make some sense of it. So before we get out of here, I really want to give a special thanks to WorldPAC for the opportunity. And again, Chad Schnitz of Topdon, great tool, my friend. I'm really excited to use it, and um, thank all of you for joining me today. So, again, tune in next time with me, Brandon Steckler, Technical Editor of Motor Age Magazine. Take care.